So welcome back to getting in a college coach conversation. Again, we're recording this in the middle of December, but you're listening to us in the first week of January. And by that point in time, most seniors will be done done with their applications, they've all been submitted, but just because you're finished working on your apps and you've submitted them to all of your schools, well, that doesn't mean that you've heard back from your schools just yet. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about what seniors can do once the apps are in. And joining me to have that conversation is my former colleague from the Reed Admission Office, uh, current colleague at College Coach, Abigail Anderson. Hey, Abigail, how's it going? Hi, Ian. It's going well. It's very cold here in Western New York. I hear there's going to be some snow out there. That's what people are saying. Yes. For once, we are not getting it. So I will lord that over my other East Coast colleagues. <laughs> but maybe by the time this airs, we will have lake effect feet of snow. Okay. And, um, you know, it's raining here, as you recall from your days. That's the usual. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we were sort of joking about this, you know, seniors are going to submit their applications. What can they do aside from just wait patiently? And maybe we'll talk a little bit about what it means to wait patiently in the context of the application process, because there are students that I think struggle to do that correctly. Yeah. But are there any specific tips that you think students should be aware of as they move from submitting applications to waiting to hear back from schools? I think that waiting is probably the hardest part of this whole process. Isn't there a song that goes, waiting is the hardest part? I think so. I'm not going to sing it right now, but yeah, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to point yes. out. Yes. No, you're so right. I think, well, I, so, okay, yeah. So I think a lot of people think that like the actual writing process or the applying or that maybe it's the SATs, ACTs are going to be the hardest part, but it's really vulnerable to send all of this info and hard work kind of out into the ether mm -hmm. and then just sit there and wait and not get feedback immediately. I think especially now we're used to pretty immediate feedback, yeah. um, whether it's on a Facebook post or our teachers providing feedback digitally now, it's getting harder to wait. Um, and unfortunately, I think the bottom line is you kind of just, you, you got to do it. You've got to wait. There's nothing you can do to speed up the process, but there are, I think, things you can do in the meantime to distract yourself and to also prep for the post-decision. I want to talk about that, but you, you just sort of reminded me of, of an aspect of our process. You know, we, we both read applications at Reed and, and we had early decision um, applications were due November 15th, uh, I believe was when we were there. And so if you think about a particular file, so one file from one student that's being sent to a college, the student thinks, okay, I've applied by November 15th, yeah. but the mechanics of actually reading that student's file could happen at any point between about the 15th and whenever the notifications go out, or at least a few days before the notifications go out. Um, and I think that that's a hard thing for students to understand. It's like, it sort of feels like, okay, I've submitted, you've read it, when are you going to tell me? Um, right. Can you sort of describe kind of what that early process just looked like in terms of the mechanics of how many files you're reading, what the discussions look like, like just how does one student's application fit within the cogs of the admission machinery? Gosh, yeah. So I think it's the, the first thing is you, you have submitted your part of the application, but there are likely a lot of other people submitting pieces of your application on your behalf. Right. And so right. until all of those pieces are read and attached to your file and collated and your birth date is matched up and your middle name is matched up, your file is actually not complete. So mm -hmm. one of the first things you really need to do is, is make sure when you, when, once you have hit submit, you need to go back and make sure that all those pieces end up with your file. Yeah. That's one thing that you can be doing right now is checking the portal and checking the status of each of the pieces of your application because you're on the hook for all of them. If a that's letter right. of rec doesn't show up, that's on you. That's it's your not, responsibility. It is yeah. your responsibility. Yeah. Um, 
And it's your responsibility to check too, That's right? right? Like the, the college is going to tell you in that one method. Most right. Likely. And, and when we were reading applications, we didn't actually see a file until it was ready to read. Right. right. So there would be outstanding materials. Those files just wouldn't come to us. Yeah. They when they were ready, they were not existed. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I didn't, I didn't know that Ian Fisher had applied until everything that Ian Fisher submitted. That's right. That's right. right. Um, and by the way, you did not read my application. No, that's some serious <laughs> Benjamin Button stuff. Uh, if you'd done that. Uh, I, had a, I have a student that I was speaking with just uh, last week, actually, and he was checking finally on his application portal, and he had actually noticed that his transcript was considered arrived, but only at the schools where he had entered in the grades and the courses manually. They had checked that they had their transcript because they count that as official for those schools. Right. But for the schools that required the official transcript, it was showing up as not having arrived. And so he went back to his counselor and said, I don't think my transcript actually got to any of my schools, even though it's showing up for these schools, because they're counting it in a different way. And they found that there was an error in the email address that they had given him to send his request. And so they finally figured that all out. But if he hadn't checked his application status portal, he wouldn't have known this was the case. Right. And he would have an incomplete application to those schools. That's, my heart just skipped a beat. I mean, that's like, that is the worst case scenario, but that's what you have to be preparing for. You want to be double checking everything. That's right. Um, so until your, until your file is com complete, complete, nothing gets read. And then I think each individual reader can kind of, most schools do what they want. I read more or less in the order of completion. So, mm -hmm. you know, if your file was completed at 1259, it was read before the one that was completed at 1.01 PM. I mean, I just went kind of chronologically. That might not be how your reader works, and but that's also not something you can control over. So you right. kind of just have to let that go. Um, and I was explaining to a student uh, the other the other week that uh, files are not complete, and the decision is not or files are not complete. Decisions are not final until the email goes out or the the right. portal is updated. Like. I might have you in my pile as an admit, but when I go to committee, I might realize you're a deny, you know? So, so things are in flux until the decision is final. And that's why you're not getting a decision even immediately after your file is read. They're waiting to see the whole pool, the entire early decision pool or regular decision pool or whichever pool you're in. Right. There are very few people in a college admission office who can unilaterally make a decision about a particular file. Usually it's the, the dean or vice president, and, and that's about it. Um, so an admission officer can't just sort of say, okay, I want this kid. They're going to get in. Might go to a second reader. Ultimately, every file typically has to be approved by the dean or by a committee of some kind. Um, and, and this is especially true at bigger universities where they have lots of seasonal staff who come in and do the application reading. They will read and rate those applications. They've been well-trained. They know what they're looking for. But just because a seasonal person says this student is in doesn't mean that that gets sort of fast-tracked through the process. Um, so there are lots and lots of things that are happening behind the scenes. And I think, you know, the instinct from a family is to say, well, what's happening with my file? Do you think it's a good idea for a student to reach out to an admission officer in the middle of February and say, hey, what's going on? Is there anything I can help? Like, can I get you anything? Do you need some more information about me? Just, you know, an earnest request like this, but maybe a little bit over exuberant. How would you respond to that? Um, no, please don't. <laughs> That's the nicest way to put it. Um, so I, when I, my last year at Reed was probably my, my heaviest reading load just because I was a more seasoned reader and I could read more. Yeah. Um, but I, I was being asked to read about 150 to 200 applications a week. Um, and so that was, that, that's a, and that that's was done on, that was done on top of answering my email or giving an information session on a Tuesday or training tour guides or, you know, all my other responsibilities, mm -hmm. planning admitted student days, which I know you did too, you know, all right. these different things. And so, um, no, <laughs> I, I did not have time to, or I did not really in, invite a lot of extra communication from students. Um, and I know 
for me personally, that would have really frustrated me. And as I say to students, the last thing you want to do is frustrate or annoy the person who's making this decision on your file. Right, right. Email is not going to be the reason you're denied, but like, let's try to keep it, let's try to keep the positives. Yeah. I mean, you know, it could ultimately come down to a situation where you have to advocate for a student in a particular position, or maybe it's a very small uh, school with a, you know, and you're just sort of fine tuning the class around the edges. And sometimes in those circumstances, it comes down to an admission officer really pushing hard for a kid and someone from another region that's saying, yeah, I'm not, I'm not attached to this student, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think you know, you're probably not going to get penalized for sending an email to an admission officer, but I think you also just want to sort of take a step back and wait. Um, wait graciously. You will hear from the schools when the time is right to hear from them, um, and it tends to be the case that that more information in this case is not always a good thing. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you a question about visiting, and I think that this is sort of a this is a tough one. Um, you know, if you're a student that's applied to a particular school, maybe you've never been to see the campus. How do you think about planning to visit? Um, and, and this might be a different answer depending on where we are in the calendar, whether that's the sort of the ski week, I guess, in February that a lot of students have um, in the Northeast, whether it's a spring break, which is in March, which is typically much closer to when decisions are announced. Um, how should students think about whether to visit campus and what to do when they're there? It, and I think we have to add in who's traveling where in 2021 and yeah. can your family travel and is it safe and what are return policies on flights and all of that. I mean, it's, it's an extra sure. complicated conversation this year, but um, the, the, you know, the drop dead date, like the last date you could possibly get your decision back is April 1st. Right, so, so planning travel, I think in March is a little risky. I think it's emotionally risky that you could be visiting, a, you could have planned a trip for a school that you end up being denied from mm -hmm. um, or that you're still waiting on a decision from and there's, that's, that's honestly just, you're kind of in limbo and that's tough to do. Um, but there's also the issue of trying to visit or revisit all of the schools where you've been admitted between April 1st and May 1st. Really hard to do. Is really hard to do. And, um, yeah. Thank you for the reality check on the pandemic as well. Cause I was sort of like taking us back to our read days where I was like, Oh, because I, I remember yeah. a time at Reed where we had a student in the lobby yep. the day before decisions were going to go out who was, not going to get in. Yeah. And as admission officers, that was really challenging. And I remember once we had a student in the lobby the day before the decisions went out who was going to get in and we went in and threw confetti on that student. And it was really exciting. So, I mean, it, it could work out well, but I think that it's probably the, the opportunity to celebrate is probably outweighed by the awkwardness of yeah. you know, being in the no pile. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think just like devoting resources and time and energy that you have, especially when you have to be extra careful around travel in this year, um, going into 2021, I think you want to be really thoughtful about why you might decide to visit a campus and what that looks like for you. And especially what information are you hoping to get that yeah. will help you to make your final decision? Yeah. Um, we haven't talked at all about the role of the deferral and what you can do if you're deferred. And, you know, I spoke with Joy a couple of weeks ago on what a deferral can kind of mean. And we'll talk about how to write that love letter to schools. Um, how would you recommend students think about providing updates for colleges during this period in time? Say you've won an award or some sort of competition has ended and, and you finished high, like, is that information that you would recommend that students actively share with colleges or um, should they keep it to themselves as they're waiting for that decision? Yeah, so I actually just had a conversation with a student um, an hour ago about this exact converse, this exact question. So um, what I recommended to her, we'll see if you back this up, okay. was that she should keep a running list of updates from the, the date of the defer until I said, late January, early February, and then mm -hmm. provide one bigger, more substantial update um, 
of that time rather than all these like mini little updates, a flurry of emails in between. No, I think that's terrible advice. No, okay. I'm just kidding. That's, that's what I would recommend as well. I think that makes, that makes total sense to me cool. is you want to send one longer thing. And even if there are yeah. no further updates, you're not worse off as a deferred student by waiting to send those mm -hmm. than you would be sending them right as they happen. Because yeah. the reality is that as, if you're deferred, that admission officer is not thinking about you until it's time to come back to your application much later in the process. Um, and for a student who's applying regular, I do think that you could send an update but I would probably send it, and I don't know what your take would be on this, but I would send it to like the admission at school name uh, address rather than the regional counselor, just so it can be filed with your application, but maybe not bother the person who specifically is reading your application. Maybe that's splitting hairs. What do you think? Yeah, I think it depends. Like if you've been in contact with that person, if they visited your high school or you had an interview with them, I think, at, you know, reach out directly. I don't think Yeah, really, that's true. Yeah. That can mean, I mean, I had great relationships with students I met on the road and they would write in and say, hey, I wanted to update you on this thing. It was nice to hear yeah. from students that you had met previously, but I think getting an email from somebody out of the blue was sort of like, oh, I would just forward it along to our admission team and exactly. let them file it in the right spot. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, this has been a great trip down <laughs> memory lane uh, for us and hopefully some helpful things for students. I, waiting is definitely the hardest part, um, but sometimes you just have to. Uh, it's, it's just part of this process. And uh, we hope very much that there's confetti and an opportunity to celebrate on the other side of the waiting. So um, best of luck over the, the next couple of months. Uh, Abigail, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Folks, when we come back, we will be talking about what to do after you've applied for college finance. So a little bit of a look at uh, how the money dovetails with the application process. Don't want to go away.